Welcome back, everyone, then, uh, officially. <laughs> You've obviously been hearing the chat during the break, but let me officially welcome you back to the next sort of hour and a half or so, so block uh, for our next session. Uh, what I didn't mention before is that today is sort of a, a shorter one. We've got about three and a half hours in total with five talks, and then tomorrow will be a bit longer with two of those sort of size, uh, size sessions. So in this back half, we're going to start with uh, Sarah Marsden from uh, Martin, I should say, from uh, Claremont Colleges, and then we've got two more uh, talks after that. So let me uh, throw it to Sarah now, who's going to talk about using lossy representations to find the neural code. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. Um, no computational neuroscience information theory workshop would be complete without a description of the information bottleneck in some fashion. So um, there are probably other people that are describing it later on, but um, I'm going to talk about one particular application of the information bottleneck method, and along with it, I'm going to talk about um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, one problem you might have when you try to actually calculate things using the information bottleneck method that um, I think I might have part of a solution to. But first, I'm going to start by setting up the problem. So, um, title of the talk is using lossy representations to find the neural code. Lossy is a technical term. Um, well, code is something I'm going to talk about. Um, so the title is a little bit jargon heavy, but uh, hopefully it will all make sense by the end. Hmm. We're going to do this. Um, let me try it again. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. You're all right. Um, don't worry. We'll make it work okay. whichever way it needs to. Okay. Yeah, so the outline of this talk is first I'm going to talk, I'm trying, going to try to set up the problem in a way such that the information bottleneck seems like a natural way of solving the issue. Um, so that means talking about what I mean by neural code. And then I'm going to tell you about the less um, fundamental question um, that's still really hard, which is how you actually compute stuff. So I'm going to start with a very, very simplified setup of how we might start to talk about something that looks like neural code. So in this simplified setup, everything's static. We have an environment. It causes neurons to fire. Um, you know, these neurons fire. Uh, and um, then the neurons cause the muscles to do something. So uh, the neurons are kind of the sensors. The muscles are the actuators. And there are two questions that conceivably I could think of somebody saying correspond to something like a neural code. So the first question is, what do neural spike trains convey about the environment? So this is basically saying that there are certain things in the environment um, that cause neurons to fire, and if um, these neurons fire, what do you know about the environment? The second question is, what do neural spike trains convey about muscles? So you can sort of ask the other question, which is, um, clearly there are some neural spike trains that say muscles fire, and what are those? Um, for no particular reason, I'm gonna focus on one of these just to be concrete. So I'm going to focus on what neural spike trains convey about the environment. And um, in thinking about this problem, I think uh, a first step is to consider a problem that's so oversimplified that the answer is obvious. So um, imagine that you have a collection of all the neural spike trains in the world. Um, and if we want to be really concrete about it, we could say that uh, this, this problem is entirely static and that really what you're looking at is you have, say, 60 neurons in a dish and you're looking at which neurons fire in response to which stimuli. So this circle right here is supposed to represent the collection of all possible neural responses. And then what you can do is you can start to divide up the neural responses based on which neural responses are elicited by which stimuli. So maybe the portion over the left is um, elicited by the sky being gray. Maybe the portion over on the right is elicited by the sky being blue. Maybe there are only four environmental variables to take care of. And if you have this situation, I think I would argue that the neural code is thought of as being the collection of neural spike trains that go along with a particular environmental variable. So whatever the spike trains over on the left are, that is the neural code for the sky is gray. And whatever the spike trains over on the right are, that's the neural code for the sky is blue. Um, you can more mathematically describe this um, partitioning of the set of all neural spike trains using the following equivalence, equivalence relation. So bear along with me. 
basically what you do is you say that two spike trains are equivalent if the conditional probability over the environment given that spike train is the same. This particular case was um, a case where these conditional probabilities uh, had support on one object, but you could imagine a more complicated scenario where if you see this particular spike train, you have a 50% chance of the sky being green and a 50% chance of the sky being blue. And if that's true for another spike train, well then from the purposes of a neural code, those two spike trains are essentially equivalent. They don't tell you any, like, you know, if you distinguish between the two of them, you don't get any more information about the environment. So this equivalence relation, I would argue, is maybe our first guess at what we mean by neural code. So another word for this equivalence relation that I put up on the screen is minimal sufficient statistics. And basically what you're asking is um, what, neural, uh, what about the neural spike trains can be the same information about the environment. I put up the equivalence relation again on the screen and you're saying what are the minimal sufficient statistics of the neural spike trains with respect to the environment. And that's just a jargony term for exactly what this equivalence relationship is. You're partitioning the neural spike trains based on what they tell you about the environment according to the conditional probability distribution of, of environment given spike train. Okay, so I think this is a really good start to the problem. Um, and I, I really like this approach. Um, the problem with this definition is that it's very likely that every spike train will have a slightly different conditional probability distribution. And then if we very closely adhere to the equivalence relation, each spike train is now its own equivalence class. And the neural code is nothing more than returning the set of all spike trains, right? So it doesn't collapse the set of spike trains into something understandable, which is what we really want when we say neural code, because if somebody just said, um, the neural code is like the huge file of data that I took while I um, you know, impinged a retina with a ton of different stimuli, that isn't what we mean by understanding. Um, the first point is something that uh, I didn't really, I, I want to create a great graphic for the first um, point, but um, I would say that when I say very likely, what I mean is that if you take a system where there's a really neat partitioning, um, where the equivalence relation is a really good job of partitioning things and add just a little bit of noise, you end up getting just this splitting where every single spike train is unique. And um, that little bit of noise I think is probably ubiquitous. So um, for these reasons, I think it's time to move from what we would call lossless representation, which is what this minimal sufficient statistics blah, blah, blah is, to something that's lossy. So when you're talking about something that's lossy, what you mean is you've got this spike train, it contains some information, information about the environment, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to compress this spike train into something understandable that you're gonna call the neural code. Um, when we were dealing with the equivalence relation and minimal sufficient statistics, we demanded that the neural code contain just as much information as the original spike train about the environment. And um, what I've sort of argued by talking about noise is that that is too harsh a demand. So what you do instead is you say, there are two things that I want out of this neural code. The first thing that I want is I want to compress the spike train. So what I want to do is I want to um, make sure that the neural code doesn't contain information about the spike train, which sounds counterintuitive. But basically you're trying to make the neural code more understandable, and that's what this first part of the objective function is about. Um, the second thing that you want to do is make sure that even though the neural code um, is a compressed version of the spike train, even though it doesn't retain all the information it could about the spike train, you want to make sure that it retains information about the environment. So as you might imagine, these two quotes, these two objectives play off of each other um, because in order for the neural code to retain information about the environment so that it is actually saying something about what the environment is doing, right, which is what you want the neural code to do, um, you have to retain information about the spike train, but you have explicitly said that you don't want to retain information about the spike train. So you end up with a non-trivial solution. And this is called the information bottleneck method. And what you can do is you can just write down an objective function that captures this. So the objective function that the information bottleneck method is based on is you say, I want to have a high mutual information between the environment and the neural code. So that's this first term right here at the bottom right. Um, but then I want to make sure that I don't have a high mutual information between the spike train and the neural code. 
You can obviously extend this. The information bulletin method is actually a particular instantiation of a branch of information theory called rate distortion theory. So if you want to, you don't have to use a mutual information really for either of the objectives. Like if you really want to, you can be very creative and just come up with something that sort of captures this idea that you want to compress but retain information. Um, the most common way that's done is that instead of talking about the mutual information between the environment and the neural code, people introduce a different objective that you know kind of corresponds to something about shared information, but it could be like a total variation of distance. It could really be anything you want. Um, the, the, the mutual information between display chain and neural code, that's pretty standard. But at the end of the day, you end up with an objective function like this. Um, the methods that I'm going to be talking about in the second part of this talk are relevant to objective functions that don't look exactly like the information bottleneck method objective function. Um, but for concreteness, I've focused on that in this talk. Um, and you can always ask me any questions about that if you're curious. Okay, so this is how, you know, hopefully I've motivated for everyone here that if you wanted to find what a neural code is, this is a reasonable objective function. And it captures two things. It captures understandability, right? We wanna make sure that the neural code is something that we can actually understand. So that when we say the neural code is, it isn't just a long list of facts. It's, it's really some condensed description. It also captures the idea that you want your neural code to say something about what the spike tree is capturing about the environment. Okay, so now let's get into the details. So this is, let's say that we all agree that this is the objective function that we wanna use. Now the question is how do we actually use it to get a neural code? Let's say you have a retina again, and you are, you're recording from a bunch of the neurons, you're showing it a bunch of different stimuli, you show a massive number of stimuli a massive number of times, you collect this huge data file that says, this is the environment that I've chosen, this is what the spike train was, and now you try to figure out what the neural code is based on the subjective function. So here, here's the current sort of method that was introduced way back when by Tishby et al. in their paper for how to actually do that. So you have your objective function up there, mutual information between environment and neural code minus some Lagrange multiplier between mutual times mutual information between spectrum and neural code. That Lagrange multiplier is something that you choose by hand, and it can be anything between zero and infinity. As you change that Lagrange multiplier, you get sort of closer and closer and closer to minimal sufficient statistics. So it's 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 really a question of choice. How understandable do you want your neural, neural code to be? versus how accurate you want it to be. Um, okay, so in order to find what's going on here, what we need to do is we can think about this objective function as being a function of a, probability, a conditional probability distribution that we're trying to find. The conditional probability distribution that we're trying to find uh, is the probability distribution of the neural code given the spike term. Once we have that, we have everything we need to know because we, from our experiments, have the joint probability distribution of spike train and environment, and we, we know there's a Markov relationship such that we can backtrack from this conditional probability distribution and that joint probability distribution, what the entire joint probability distribution is between environment, neural code, and spike train. Okay, so probably the most obvious thing to do is we're just gonna take a derivative of the objective function with respect to the thing we're trying to find, and we're gonna set it equal to zero. When you do that and rearrange stuff, you end up getting this equation down here. Like I said, you don't necessarily have to choose a mutual information, especially for the first term. And if you don't, um, if you choose something else for that first term, the DKL in the bottom equation here changes into something else. It changes into some other distance between those two um, conditional probability distributions. But you can, as soon as you look at this equation though, um, I think a few things um, have popped out at me over the years, which is that this is a completely non-trivial equation. Um, on both, like, it looks like it would be somewhat easy to solve at first glance, but um, on the left-hand side, you have your conditional probability distribution that you're trying to find. And on the right-hand side, you have a non-trivial function of the conditional probability distribution that you're trying to find. So the way that people usually go about solving this is that they iterate this equation. So you guess at some conditional probability distribution of neural code given spike train, and you calculate everything on the right-hand side, 
and that gives you a new prob conditional probability distribution of neural code given spike train, and you do this over and over and over again until you converge. You are emphatically not guaranteed to converge to the optimum. Um, you will converge to something that's hopefully reasonable, but it's this is not a convex objective function. Um, if you do uh, what I would call vanilla rate distortion theory, where maybe you don't have uh, such a complicated objective, uh, you do converge. It is a convex objective. You do converge to the global optimum. Um, that is not the case here. So that's already a computational difficulty. But it gets even worse. So um, I oversimplify things to start with. Uh, I said that environment caused spike trains, caused muscles, and I ignored the fact that there's this thing called time. And when we talk about time, what we really mean is that there's some environment past that caused a particular spike train. Um, and that spike train could have behavior that's relevant that persists far into the future. So in other words, first point, maybe the neurons are coding for the past of the environment. And that actually seems somewhat reasonable to me because um, one of the best ways to figure out what to do is to look at the past, see what worked, and then try and predict the future. Um, and then another point that um, I can, you know, I can go back and forth on is that uh, it's possible that what matters is not just the current neural spike train. It could be that the neural spike train that's relevant, um, you know, that we should be basing the neural code on, goes for, you know, at least a second into the future. Okay, that's sort of a long time scale, but um, if we introduce these two complications, we've got a much harder problem. On paper, it kind of looks the same. So on paper, what I'm saying is that we're going to try and compress neural spike trains in the semi-infinite future, because I've just gone whole hog on this, and we're going to compress them into the neural code, and we're going to try and use that neural code to retain information about semi-infinite paths of the environment. And this is going to be what I really mean when I say neural code, is that there's a semi-infinite future and a semi-infinite past. Okay, um, that's fine on paper when you're just doing pen and paper, but when you go to a computer to try and code it up, you end up having a problem. So I'm gonna turn to a slightly similar objective um, and illustrate what the problem is. So let's say that I see a bar moving on a screen and I'm trying to predict where it's gonna go. So I wanna look at the past of the bar to predict the future. This is very similar to the problem that we were just talking about. Um, just imagine, just replace you know, neural spike train in the future with um, bars position in the future and replace bars position in the past with, sorry, replace environment in the past with bars position in the past. So mathematically, they're, these are very related problems. Um, for the rest of the talk, now that I've sort of set up the problem and set up why I think that uh, talking about lossy representations is a relevant thing for talking about the neural code, I'm gonna focus on this easier problem where I just sort of have a bar moving on screen. Um, in, the, in the problem where you have a bar moving on the screen, if you set up this, the problem, what, you, what you're saying is you're saying, I'm going to look at this semi-infinite pass to the bar's position, and I'm going to compress it into this R, and I want this R to retain information about the future of the bar's position. The problem computationally are these red dots, or are the dots that are in the red boxes. So when we look at the semi-infinite past, um, it's not just you know things that are five steps in the past, it's really the semi-infinite past, going back to the beginning of time for all I know. And when we look at the semi-infinite future, it's not just what happens two time steps into the future, it's everything that happens after that. So if we wanna really solve this problem, we're, um, we have what's called a course of dimensionality. This problem gets exponentially harder to solve in terms of memory and compute time as we look farther and farther back into the past and farther and farther into the future. So um, people have thought about this problem in other contexts. They weren't thinking about the neural code when they talked about this necessarily, but um, they were trying to solve this problem. And one of the things they did is they just said, okay, well, we know that this is not gonna be a perfect approximation, but we are just gonna look our time steps into the past and our time steps into the future, and we are going to throw away everything in the gray. So if somebody told you that you were, that the bar's position was either a zero or a one, um, so the bar's just sort of hopping around. And 
they gave you the entire they gave you the entire path and they gave you the entire future and they said perform your algorithm what this approximation would do is it would look at you know in this case four steps into the past four steps into the future and just throw everything else out as irrelevant data okay obviously this is not going to be a perfect approximation like i said but it's going to get us somewhere so the question is how how well can we do um, so i'm going to tell you sort of the punchline of a paper that i wrote with jim crutchfield on this which is that you end up doing surprisingly badly when you make this approximation and you have to become very very clever in order to actually solve the original question you're trying to get at, which is how do we deal with finding mineral code when our state space is growing unboundedly? Um, and so the example that I've chosen for this is an example that I think should convince you that sometimes it's surprising where you mess up. So on the left-hand side, what we have is a machine that generates zeros and ones. This is called a hidden Markov model. Um, this is a particular type of hidden Markov model called a unifuler hidden Markov model. And there are two states to it. Those are states A and B. You don't actually get to see those states. All you get to see are the zeros and ones. And the way this works is if you're in state A, you flip a fair coin. Um, with probability a half, you see a zero and you move to state A. That's why there's that arrow that has the loop. With probability a half, you emit a one and you move to state B. And if you're in state B, you always move to state A. Okay, so this is one of the simplest hidden Markov models I think anybody will ever see. It's only two states. It's binary alphabet. Um, it's incredibly simple. So um, that's what I'm going to be using in this particular slide to generate the sequence of zeros and ones that I see and then try to perform the information bottleneck al algorithm. OK, that is the left hand side of the slide. Right hand side of this slide is what's called an information um, well, the information curve, an information diagram. Um, and you see this a lot of times with um, the information bottleneck method. On the bottom, you have a description of how compressed your representation is. So the x-axis is this mutual information between your representation and the past. So remember, this is, this is something that you want to make small. You want to compress this as much as possible. And at the top, uh, sorry, the y-axis, you see the mutual information between your representation and the future. So this is something that you want to make as big as possible. You want to retain information about the future as you compress information about the past. Um, now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out these neural representations, but one way of figuring out how good your representation is, is to plot what's called um, an information curve. And the information curve is supposed to split this plane into two. One portion of the plane is going to be uh, the achievable region, things that you can conceivably achieve with some sensor somewhere. And the other portion would be the unachievable region, things that you will never be able to achieve no matter how clever you are with any sensor whatsoever. And what you're trying to look for are those neural codes, are those representations, are those lossy representations that lie exactly on the border between those two, between the achievable and unachievable. So, um, you know, one way of figuring out if your method is any good is you say, uh, you know, is my representation anywhere close to the information curve? So um, in this plot on the right, I've, I'm showing what the approximation that I have talked about previously, where you look at only length r pasts, I'm, I'm showing you what uh, lossy representations those get you versus the true like ground truth, how close are you to the information curve? So the blue is the ground truth. The blue tells you that you're splitting this plane into two. Um, everything below the blue line to the right of it is achievable. Everything else is unachievable. And if you're looking for something that's a good representation of the past, you want to get as close to that curve as possible. Um, then you see all these cross hashes in purple and blue and red and green, and all those indicate uh, for the approximation I talked about previously, where your lossy representations lie. So green comes from pretending that only two things in the past and two things in the future matter. Red comes from pretending that only three things in the past and three things in the future matter. Blue is for four and four. And purple is for five things in the past, five things in the future. And so what you can see from this is that if you pretended that only two things in the past matter, and only two things in the future mattered, um, you would have 
you would end up with a lossy predictive representation that was really, really far away from the blue line, which is where you want to be. And surprisingly, this is true even when you go up to a length five past and a length five future. The reason that this was sort of a shocking graph to me is if you look at the left, that machine is just so simple. It's maybe it's deceptively simple. Um, it's got two states. Uh, it's not like anything complicated happens in either of the two states. You can't simplify it down to a one state machine, but it's basically as simple as you can get without being completely boring. Um, and this blue line, which I got using methods that I'll talk about, uh, is, you know, it, it looks, it looks, I guess, straightforward. And then if you just start computing stuff, you realize you're so far away from getting this, even when you make reasonable seeming approximations. So maybe um, just to pause here for a second, maybe another way of, of putting this talk is, you know, this problem is even harder than we thought. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll tell you something, I'll tell you about a story that I think, a, a method that I think will make things a little bit easier. So um, you may be wondering how we got this blue curve and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, but what I want to propose is a new method for, for getting these lossy representations. So this method that I'm talking about pertains in particular to lossy representations where there's a time component. If there's some sort of sequential component to your, to your um, objective function, to your information bottleneck method problem, this is, uh, I think, a good way of approaching it. And so the old way of approaching it um, was to go from the top, which is just sequence data, to essentially embrace the cursive dimensionality and say, well, I'll just truncate it in some way. I'll truncate the state space. And I know that you know my, my resources grow exponentially with it, so I'm not gonna make the truncation too big. And then um, from directly from the sequence data, you try to get your, your information curve, you know, whatever you want, your loss, your representation, and then you're done. And hopefully the slide I just showed you is tells you that that is not necessarily the best way to go about it. So I'm arguing for a more complicated procedure that will, will give more accuracy. So the idea is if you have some sort of sequential aspect to your data, what you can do is you can infer a model first. Um, and how you infer the model, that's, that's kind of up to you. There are a ton of algorithms. You can do Bob Welsh, that's sort of the famous one. You can do Bayesian structural inference. There's a really clever um, non-parametric Bayesian approach to this model inference as well. There's scissor, parse tree. There's a wealth of algorithms that you can use to infer a model. Um, and they all have their drawbacks. They all don't work sometimes, but you know, at, there are tons of methods and at some point you can use your best guess as to which method you should use. Um, once you get your hidden Markov model that describes the data, what you can do is perform this operation called a mixed state operator. And that's kind of technical and complicated and I'm not gonna get into it, but let, I'm just letting you know there exists an, uh, an algorithm to turn whatever hidden Markov model you get into what's called an epsilon, epsilon machine. So an epsilon machine is a particular type of hidden Markov model, um, also called a, called a unifielder hidden Markov model that has desirable properties that let us get um, from directly from the epsilon machine or the unifield or hidden Markov model to the lossy representations I was talking about earlier. So it's a longer trajectory to go from sequence data uh, to the thing you want to get, was, which was the lossy representation. Um, but I will show you some more examples that I hope will convince you that actually this is a really uh, reasonable approach to take and it might benefit. Um, so let me just briefly talk about how to infer a model. Um, I wanted to uh, point out that every single model inference procedure has benefits and drawbacks. Um, so, and I'll just go through a few of them. So there's this thing called Bayesian structural inference where basically you say that you are going to look over a set of possible unifielder hidden Markov models. And um, again, that's just a special type of hidden Markov model. And uh, you are going to then calculate the likelihood that the data that you've seen is generated by that model. And if you're clever about, you know, how you choose your priors and stuff like that, you can actually make this analytically tractable. Okay, the drawback to that method is that you have to search over a set of, of machines and the number of machines that you have to search over as you increase the size of the machine 
grows super exponentially. So practically speaking, you can get up to about six states and then your computer's gonna uh, go kaput. Um, this, which is too bad, you can, if you know something about what you think the machine is gonna look like, you can bake that into the algorithm and that can sort of speed things up, which is something that I pursued a little bit during my PhD. There's also a really clever approach to this in a non-parametric sense where you basically say, I'm going to grow the size of my machine with the amount of data that I have, and I'm just going to assume that my machine is gonna grow without bound as I get more and more data. So um, that's a really clever approach. The problem with that is if what you're actually looking at is something from like a simple two-state hidden Markov model, um, the, this non-parametric approach is probably gonna give you the wrong answer. So even that has a drawback, even though that's one of the favorite methods I've never understood. Um, and then there is something called scissor um, that can sort of result in a proliferation of states if you aren't really careful about how you control matching conditional probability distributions. Um, there is uh, some work that uh, I was lucky enough to do with Suzanne Still and um, Lisa Miller and the, I think there's some other people in the paper too. Um, the paper's not out yet, but there's this thing called the recursive information bottleneck, which I think is a really clever approach to this. Um, and if you're curious, just uh, hit me up in the comments. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, we have not studied that method enough to know what the drawbacks are yet. Um, and I just, and there, of course there are tons of other methods. I just wanted to briefly say, if you were trying to say, oh, we're gonna infer a model, the model that we're gonna infer is gonna come from order our Markov estimation or optimal causal inference, I'm gonna tell you that you're already basically baking in the approximation that I'm trying to get away from. Because when you do order our Markov estimation, you're basically saying only the last R things matter and only the next R things are relevant for understanding the future. And you know that is explicitly not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get away from that order our Markov approximation and do something that's sort of in the hidden state space rather than being on the visible level. And optimal causal inference is the same problem. Okay, so if I go back to slides and I uh, tell you about sort of the procedure here, I've told you about model inference. I've told you, and you'll just have to trust me on it, that there's this thing called a mixed state operator that will get you the machine you want. I haven't told you how to go from this unifeeler hidden Markov model, epsilon machine, maximum predictive model, whatever you want to call it, to the lossy representation. So I'm going to tell you that now. Basically, um, Jim Crutchfield and I proved a theorem. And the theorem says that if you compress the past to, uh, well, maintain information about the future, that's the same as compressing what are called four time causal states to, min uh, to retain information about reverse time causal states. When you see four time causal states, what you should think is just what are the hidden states of that Markov, hidden Markov model. Um, and reverse time causal states are basically, if you look at the process in reverse, so you go from future to past, uh, what are the states of that hidden Markov model? And then there's this, um, there's this technicality about whether or not your distortion measures in f-divergence. The reason we put that in is because we want to make this as general as possible. So this will apply not just to information bottleneck method type things, it will also apply to things where um, you have some other sort of uh, dis divergence between two conditional probability distributions as, as uh, your statement about how you want to retain information about the future. So let me show you sort of like what's going on here. So um, our lossy representation used to be that we wanted to find the conditional probability distribution of this representation R given the past, such that we would maximize uh, the future, the, the information it retained about the future minus the Lagrange multi multiplier times the information it retained about the past. Okay, that's the top line right there. And we've already talked about it, that's the thing we wanna solve. So basically what this theorem does is it takes the future and replaces it by this other variable, this reverse time causal state. It takes the past and it replaces it by this other variable called a four time causal state. And uh, the thing that is really important about this replacement is that even though you might, you might be looking at infinite futures and infinite pasts, you could be looking at finite reverse time and four time causal states 
as I will be in the next few slides. Um, even if the number of forward and reverse time causal states is infinite, you can potentially get better truncation properties. So if you sort of truncate in a hidden state space rather than truncating um, a particular length of past and future, you might get better approximation properties regardless. So, yes. Okay. Um, and I made sort of a note about this here. So, uh, as I say, typically there are infinite minimal sufficient statistics. So typically, um, S plus and S minus in this slide right here are going to be infinite, typically. Um, but uh, there's sort of a, a principled way of truncating them, even when they're uncountably infinite. Um, and we, and sometimes that beats the order on Markov approximation. Um, so going back to this, I would say, like any approximation method, there are sort of pros and cons. So the approximation method we were trying to replace was one where we looked at R into the past and R into the future. And basically we replaced it with something that um, is gonna work great if you have a finite hidden markup model that describes your data, but it might not work so well if you have a really complicated data set. And um, in that case, uh, whether or not order R Markov is better than this method depends really uniquely on what your actual data is. Okay, so going back to this diagram right here, I didn't tell you how I got the blue line. I got the blue line from the theorem that I just showed you. So until we had actually um, gotten this theorem down, we had no idea that the green, red, blue, and purple were so far away from optimal. In fact, if you go back to one of the original papers on this, when they didn't have the theorem, you can see them draw these information curves that now turn out to be uh, far off from the optimal. Um, just to show you that I'm not cherry picking, uh, here is another hidden Markov model on the left. So in this hidden Markov model, there's three states, A, B, and C. Um, this is called the random insertion process because, uh, well, it doesn't matter, but um, basically, you know, it's another simple hidden Markov model. It's only three states, binary alphabet, nothing complicated is going on here. Um, if you do the same procedure and try to get these information curves, the blue is the ground truth. So the blue tells you this is where you, like, you want to be on this line if you get a lossy representation of this process um, in order to think, convince yourself that you're doing well. And uh, again, the order R Markov approximations fail spectacularly. Green, red, blue, purple, very far off from the blue line. Um, and then just sort of one last example. Uh, so uh, some of you may have heard of the tent map, and I kind of want to illustrate what these lossy features actually look like. So if you're talking about the tent map, what's basically going on is you've got a number between zero and one, and then you have some relationships shown at left on the y-axis between your previous number and your next number. And this, uh, and if you draw out what this next number looks like in relation to the previous number, it forms the shape of a tent, hence the name tent map. Um, what you can do, uh, for various reasons that I won't get into, is you can turn this into a sequence of zeros and ones. You can drop a line straight down the middle and basically say that if your number is between zero and a half, you record it as a zero. If it's between a half and a one, you record it as a one. And there's some theorem that says that this is like an okay thing to do and you don't lose information. Um, if you then look at uh, what the sequence of zeros and ones looks like, you realize that it can be described by a four-state hidden Markov model. Okay, so uh, this four-state hidden Markov model is, in some sense, all you need to know about this complicated tent map. When we do our um, information curves for the tent map, we find that, you know, order two Markov approximations, the green, are not so great. Order three Markov approximations, or the red, are not so great and so on and so on, they actually aren't as bad as they, they were for the previous two examples, the even process and the random insertion process, because you can see that the purple is actually relatively close to uh, the blue, which is the ground truth. But what I really want to show you from this was that you can draw this like pretty cool diagram, which um, I'm still not sure what to call it. But as you change this Lagrange multiplier, I told you, you basically control the trade-off between compression and accuracy. And if you look at how much compression you have as a function of this Lagrange multiplier, you see that way over when beta is equal to zero, uh, you have 
you know, no, you, you retain no information whatsoever about the future, and you retain no information whatsoever about the past. And then as you increase beta, you suddenly have sharp jumps in accuracy, and also in terms of the amount of memory that you need in order to store those features. So as you increase beta, there's sort of like a critical beta where you can like jump up a little bit, and you have uh, you 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 have some increase in accuracy. It kind of plateaus and then jumps up again. Kind of plateaus, jumps up again. Um, these are all numerical. You can't do this analytically. This is not Gaussian information bottleneck. This is you know tabular. Um, and I've shown the ground truth blue as well as all the order our Markov approximations on this graph. Um, but the thing I really want to show you is you can look at you know these plateaus and ask what features am I picking up? And we've tried to show that here over on the right. So over on the right, you see the original hidden Markov model that describes this tent map. And then in, a, in panels A, B, C, and D, uh, you see what the hidden mark, what are the features that you're picking up? There are some combination of A, B, and C, and D, but it's not completely trivial. So when you have no like conception of accuracy whatsoever, you basically pick up a little bit of information about D and that's it. It's almost as if you're just remembering D the entire time. Um, if you go to sort of the next plateau, sort of the next step up, and you ask what you're remembering about the process in order to predict, you are remembering A, and you're remembering D, and that's it. And next step up, you're remembering A, B, and D, and the next step up, you actually do remember all of them, as you expect. So I have a speculation, which is that this trick that I just showed you, I think it could be useful for approximating mineral code. I haven't used it, and it has not yet been used. Um, and I'm just going to send an offer. If you're interested in trying this method on your data, just email me. Um, and I'd just be happy to hand you my code. And uh, in general, I think there's this trick where if we move to thinking about hidden state spaces rather than just what we see, we can get some benefit, you know, mathematically and computationally. Um, I really want to thank Joe for inviting me. Um, and I'd like to thank the person who's funding me. And I'd like to thank a, a bunch of people for wonderful conversations. And I think I finished. Oh, thank you. Right thank you, yeah. Sarah. I was just about to say we're at about uh, just over 40 minutes, so good timing. I'll uh, start the audible applause. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's one question here so that makes choosing it fairly easy. Uh, this is from Arbet. I'll send him an invite in case he wants to, to come on to to chat about it. While he's doing that, I'll, I'll read it out for the purposes of the recording. Uh, using reservoir computing, it is surprisingly good how we can infer the future sequence just with a linear readout. Do you have an intuition of how this reservoir is achieving such an efficient lossy coding, or is there something different going on there? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm actually working, I've done a little bit of calculation with this, and so, um, you know, stay tuned. I. I have looked at where reservoir computers fall relative to these information groups, and they are not as good as LSTMs, but they're better than DLMs, and they're not on the curve. So they, they are not actually super efficient, even though they're like good at predicting. So mm -hmm. you can imagine that if the curve looks like this and you're trying to be over here, they're sort of like using more resources than they need to, but they're doing a really good job with prediction. So at the end, they will end up like still not in a sweet spot next to the to the to the nice curve next to the to the to the limit. The I'm sorry. Limit. Can you repeat that? I'm so sorry. So, so still, they will not end up next to the sweet spot uh, sweet uh, spot uh, that you want on the information limit. Yeah, I mean, look, it depends on exactly what you stimulate them with, and it depends on how close you want to be close to the blue curve because like reasonable people can disagree. Um, mm -hmm. But I can find examples where they're like surprisingly bad, even for very simple stuff. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So that was the only question that we had there, but we're pretty much right on time anyway. So we might we might leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you. Uh,